Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. As I was uh, uh, watching the news the other night, there were a lot of um, you know, violent crime uh, committed by young people. And um, yeah, and you hear those stories about um, you know, uh, immorality and, and this sort of thing, all sorts of, um, um, you know, sort of problems that people uh, have these days, particularly young people. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking things have certainly changed since I was uh, young when most people went to church and most people, you know, feared God um, and were aware that, you know, one one day there's going to be a judgment and, uh, you know, we're going to be held accountable for our actions. And, of course, that's why we need Jesus as our, as our saviour because, um, you know, one day there is going to be a, a judgment of all the bad things that, that people have done and, and um, how people have destroyed this beautiful creation. And as I thought about it, I was thinking, you know, the damage that has been done through our education system of, of teaching young people uh, that we evolved, that um, there were, we came about by pro- random processes of evolution, um, that the, you know, the, the universe just evolved with, as we know, you know, the, that's taught the Big Bang Theory and then, you know, we, and then evolution, somehow life started and, and then everything um, just to evolve from that. And therefore, there's no accountability. There's just humans are on top of the, the sort of the, the food chain, so to speak. And uh, it's, it seems then that as young people growing up with this culture, there's been a couple of effects. And one of those effects has been to, uh, again, well, there's no God that we have to be accountable for. We'll do whatever we can get away with. And I can remember uh, listening to a talk uh, by David Belinsky, um, a philosopher, a mathematician from um, uh, Princeton University there, and, um, and he, he, he pointed out that unless people are, um, and, uh, are aware that there is a supernatural power that we've been, that we're accountable to, then there's no breaks on, on human behaviour. Human, humans will do whatever they can, can get away with. And we, we have this sinful, we, well, we have this tendency to, to be selfish, to do, uh, and if it means hurting other people or robbing other people, if we can get away with it, we'll, we'll do it. And we see this proliferated, for example, around us with all the, the scams that again has been reported on the news and, and people, you know, contacting people over the phone or on the internet, however they do it, and sort of trying to uh, to very sneakily get money out of people. And so we we see this behaviour. And while there's always been, you know, robbers and, 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 and bad things all down through history and people have, have fought wars, um, there was generally a, an accountability to the um, pe- people recognised that there was a God. One day there was going to be accountability. And, of course, in pagan times they tried to appease the gods with you know, different sacrifices and all this sort of thing. And as, as I saw, thought, you know, thought about this, there's, there's that aspect of the teaching of evolution that has made our society very secular. But there is also a, another aspect uh, to this, uh, and and that is that we see that governments within our country uh, are making, introducing more and more laws based on the that there is no God that we're accountable to, or the God of the Bible is not the God that we are accountable to, and so they're uh, looking at bringing in laws that uh, determine that will affect how Christians can worship, how they can educate their children and, and so forth. And, and this is a very serious um, aspect in my view. And as I've uh, thought about this too, I think so much of this has stemmed from uh, this intellectual 
uh, approach that there is no God. We evolve. We know that now. Science can explain our origins, and um, and therefore we can go ahead and, and and make these these laws. And the fact now that we have you know politicians and governments that are making these laws irrespective of God's law is is very very sad. Because I think what the problem is that these people that believe that they're so educated and that they can make these laws and have been totally misled in their own education system. Because we now know the evidence is just overwhelming that evolution is impossible and didn't occur. It can't have occurred. But the problem that we've had, as I've mentioned before, and that you know, top scientists like James M. Tour, the um, world-leading synthetic chemist, have pointed out that a lot of people, particularly biologists and geneticists, don't really understand the maths and the chemistry that underpins the theory of evolution if it could occur, and that we now know is impossible. The chemical reactions don't occur. The math shows that it's absolutely impossible. And there's this ignorance that they, uh, because of this inculcation of evolutionary theory, it's, it's actually blinded them to be able to understand the deeper concepts of science that are in, involved in this. You know, as I, as I think back on this, my uh, first uh, boss uh, that uh, I worked for was Dr. Neil Gray. He was a point who was the first PhD qualified chemical engineer uh, to work uh, at the BHP Central Research Laboratories. And of course, BHP is the world's largest mining company. But back in those days, it was the largest steel producer in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, you know, I worked uh, with him. I was his uh, personal assistant when he was appointed. He'd just come from uh, Imperial College London. And uh, he later went on to uh, lecture at the University of Melbourne and he was later telling me, he used to point out to students, look, do you really believe that all these amazing life forms around us could arise by random chance mutations? You know, the the maths and the, the engineering aspects just is, you know, totally un- impossible for these structures to occur by chance randomly. And I think this is just, you know, this is an important point. I mean, I serve on the Industrial Advisory Committee for a School of uh, Chemical Engineering in um, one of us, for one of Australia's top universities. And I'm currently involved as a research advisor for another cooperative research centre at another top Um, Australian University that is well known for its uh, engineering school research. And one of the projects that's just been approved the other day by the the board uh, that I'm involved in is where we're looking at uh, designing what we call conditioners that um, enable you to dry some sort of seed, whether it be a coffee bean or wheat or, or something like that, which have we during the cooking process may have a very high moisture level and then you want to take it back down to a much lower moisture level very rapidly um, and uh, without destroying the nutritive value so that at the, uh, at the lower moisture level now, you can actually process um, this raw material in a way that it will maintain structures that will, um, uh, will perform perfectly um, in the processing technology platforms that you're using. For example, if you're making something like a, a biscuit, that um, or a cookie that um, you know we buy in a packet from the supermarket and again we take for granted but so often we're so removed from the processes that involved in this when when these things are mass produced as opposed to making it home on your tray those biscuits all have to be the same size exactly to fit into the packet they have to rise by exactly the same amount every time and that manufacturer is producing you know thousands of these an hour probably um, at, at a massive uh, rate of uh, production so that it's economically viable. And uh, again, everything has to be controlled so it'll fit in the packaging, it won't rattle around and break and so forth. 
and the control and then the design of these dryers. So we just want to change the moisture content for a grain, maybe a ton of grain, which can t- which could contain millions of individual, uh, say, grains of wheat. And we want to have those flowing through this system so that they come in at one moisture level and go out at another. And it involves what we call com- uh, computational fluid dynamics. Now, on this particular project that we have for a client that um, we are going to look at, at drying, in this particular case wheat, we are going to have a fully qualified university professor as the research advisor, and we're going to have a PhD student. So that's a person who, in engineering, has an honours degree, first class uh, honours degree in engineering, and he'll be studying for his doctorate. And his doctorate will be looking at the design of the structure of um, this device uh, will be and uh, looking at the mathematics of it so that we can actually control for uh, raw materials that come in at different moisture levels but have them come out at the exact moisture level at the end. Because after all, if you're buying something like wheat or coffee beans, these but coming in from raw material, they're going to have quite varying moisture conditions depending on the farms they're grown on, whether there's been rain and, and so forth, these variables. But at the end, it all has to come out con- at a particular control rate. And we might have you know, airflow, the rate of rotation, uh, the rate of flow that these particles are coming in. And yet all the particles have to be dried. We don't want to miss one. We have to dry all. Now... These things that we just take for granted when we buy a packet of biscuits is going to involve a three-year project, a lot of mathematics, the computer programs that are involved in computational fluid dynamics, uh, generally costing in the order of $60,000, this sort of thing, for licences, and involved highly intelligent programmers developing uh, the models behind these things. And most of us, as we buy a biscuit, we don't realise the technology that and the design that has gone in behind the manufacturer of that cookie or that, that biscuit behind there. When we look at the things in nature, they're far, far more complex than that, far, far more complex. And yet we want to believe, we're, we're told that we have to believe that these amazing structures came about by random mutations. Random mutations to a language, to a set of instructions that are written using chemical compounds, four basic chemical compounds that we abbreviate A, C, T and G, that are for the names of these chemical compounds when we're writing the code. And the codes involve millions of letters. And what we're saying is that random blind changes to those codes can produce these amazing structures, interrelated structures of the plants, flowers, birds and bees. Now today I plan to talk about birds and and bees. I have a friend um, who was uh, uh, an ornithologist, Uh, he's a a professor in that area, he's a world authority on uh, swifts and swiftless, Professor Michael Tarbiton, a good friend, I've I've known him for uh, over 40 years. And it was interesting uh, reading a, an article that he'd written in a, in a very interesting book, and it's called Design and Catastrophe, uh, 51 Scientists Explore Evidence in Nature, and it's published by Andrews University Press, and uh, quite an interesting one. So reading, uh, I was reading he, the article that he had on the interrelated design in the Swiftlet, and he said... Uh, birds have to maintain five strategies for incubating legs, and all five have been known for more than 150 years. And, um, yeah, scientists felt that every conceivable pattern for complicating the essential task of incubating the embryo and uh, bird's eggs had been recorded. So we're just looking at something, you know, we're, we're just looking at how do we incubate an egg? Well, we think that's pretty basic, wouldn't we? Well, the basic categories, one, either both parents... Uh, sit on the um, the eggs or one parent only or other adults of the same species might sit on the eggs or uh, other species like the cuckoos um, might come and sit on the eggs or there might be non-animal heat um, such as uh, megapodes that use uh, mounds of, of compost. Um, but back in 1985, 
Dr. Tarbiton discovered that Australian swiplets, which produce a, only one egg because they can't find enough feed to, to find two nestlings, remember they eat insects, uh, swifts, uh, they're able to equal the annual productivity of other swiftlets, um, which uh, produce clutches of two. And this was achieved despite the, the fact that both uh, species, these Australian swiftlets, can only find enough insects to raise their clutches for um, a, a, the 125 to 150 days. Now, they, what they do is, what he found that they did was that the swiftlets uh, employ a very interesting strategy. And what happens is a second a single edge clutch is produced once the first nestling becomes homeothermic. That is, um, it, it's warm enough, it can keep itself warm by itself. And what it does is it begins providing the warmth for the second egg. And so the second egg is actually incubated by the first hatchling. Isn't that interesting? And... Um, this strategy, he points out, is so finely tuned that in most cases the second egg hatches the day after the first nestling fledges, allowing both uh, parents to continue feeding until the second ne uh, um, nestling fledges. Um, that is, flies off, which usually is just before a flux of insect uh, uh, prey at the end of the wet seasons in the savannah environment. Now, another thing that I found out in reading his article was that swiftlets have the ability to echolocate. That is, they can find their uh, prey um, and they can make their, find their way into caves every night to sleep and, and breed. And um, uh, Dr. Tarbiton points out that he's found nests up to one kilometre from cave entrances, so they're flown that far up into the dark cave. That's interesting. I didn't realise that there were birds that could echolocate as well. Now, just imagine the changes to the genetic code to provide all these abilities and to provide um, these particular instincts. Now, we talk about instincts. Now, remember, instincts are non-material. Our brains are material, but these whole... Um, Control and I guess the hormonal control that controls the egg production, all these sort of things. The hormones that are involved that are complex chemicals that are all produced by random mutations. No, these are all evidence of an amazing um, cre creators. Um, and um, these little um, swiftlets, of course, they mostly nest up high away from in the caves where uh, snakes can't get them. And uh, in the Cook Islands, they uh, spread their nests out in, in caves to avoid uh, the um, crabs that climb over the cave walls <laughs> looking for nestlings. Um, in, uh, on the other hand, in Papua New Guinea, they nest on the floor of the cave where there's no ground-based predators. And uh, it's interesting that, of course, Swiss produce a saliva, which is like a superglue that glues the um, nests together. It's um, quite amazing, actually. Um, and again, though, when we think about it, the composition of this um, glue, again, the compounds that are involved in this saliva that becomes this glue, all have to be, again, coded for in the genetic code to make uh, as a result of random mutations. I think um, he talks about a third design feature in the swiftlets is that they can fly all day without resting. And even during breeding, they hold insects they, ca they catch in a pouch below their mouth that's designed to hold over 750 insects. Again, these structures... Um, 
that、um, enable them to carry the food. Another thing is the nest things are designed to grow slowly. That means that they can survive not only being fed just two or three times a day, but even during cyclones to prevent the parents from catching food for several days. And so all these factors that are in there. Remember, all these abilities are in there as a result of the genetic code coding. For these metabolic rates and so forth that are there, the compounds that control the metabolic rate, all have to be produced by chemical reactions that are encoded for in the DNA to make the compounds. And、um, one of the again the research engineering research that's been done、um, as to why swifts and swiftlets can fly all day.、Um, At one of the universities, showed that their wings work quite differently from other birds. They use leading edge vortices to provide lift. And、uh, studies at Lund University, which is there down the bottom of Sweden, there、uh, in a wind tunnel, have shown that some of the design features that enable low energy flight、uh, enable low energy flight even while pursuing insects all day. And、um, in swifts and swiftlets, the upstroke of the wing provides thrust, as well as lift, equal to sixty percent of the lift on the downstroke. So, isn't that amazing? The amazing design and aerodynamic design of these wings means that these birds get lift on the upstroke as well as the downstroke, because most birds don't produce any lift on their upstroke. And what we have to remember is, you know, that、uh, evolutionists say, "Oh, this is some random mutation that's enabled them to develop so they can fly fast enough to catch insects and all this sort of thing." But when you think about it, the amount of design that goes in to actually design the leading edge of the feathers and so forth, and the structures of the muscles and the and the、um, You know the the skin on the bird and the nerves and the the muscles that are involved and ligaments and all these sort of things. They all have to be coordinated. And when I think about, we just、uh, got this project. It's going to run for th-、uh, for three years,、uh, through probably four years, looking at you know designing just a design to dry、uh, some grain. When you think of the amount of engineering that goes into design. Um, wings, and when you look at the amount of physics that we knew a hundred years ago, and yet it still took us ages to, and 150 years ago, the amount of physics that we knew,、uh, but it still took us an amazing amount of time to, and thousands of engineers to get to designing aircraft that we fly today. And those aircraft still don't self-reproduce; they still require intelligent pilots to find them, they don't, and、um, or design the control mechanism. And、um, we expect that, that, and again, they still can't fly and have the same performance and efficiency that birds like swiftlets have.、Um, to me, it's、um, when we look at this the. Evidence, the amazing evidence for design, and I think when you understand the problems that, as engineers, we try to solve using our knowledge of maths and physics and thermodynamics and so forth,、um, and the amount of time that is spent, and studies that are spent, and experiments、uh, to get it right, to get the maths right,、um, it, it makes you realise. That things like the design of birds' wings, the feathers, the way their structures, and that just can't arise by chance.、Um, the wing design um, again uh, generates a clockwise leading edge vortices on the downstroke, anti-clockwise leading edge vortices on the upstroke, and all these elements together have the effect of increasing manoeuvrability in a bird. That is otherwise designed for speed, and so not only are these birds extremely fast, but they can have high manoeuvrability that enables them to manoeuvre and catch flying insects. So that's what they feed on: flying swifts. The、um, 
Yeah, Professor Tarbiton concludes by saying the range of design features, all essential to enable Swiftlets to do what they do, with none of them able to achieve their end results by themselves, speak of an intelligent origin and a create origin rather, and a creator who plan nature not only to achieve a multitude of diverse ecological relationships, but also to occupy our minds for eternity. And so I, I think what he's saying there is there's so much that we can learn from just studying. And he, he spent a whole lifetime just studying swiftlets, let alone all the other 5,000 or nearly 10,000, I think there are species of birds um, around and all their unique features. Well, I had planned to talk a bit about the amazing uh, structure of mathematics of, uh, of uh, bees and some of their behaviour, but I'll leave that for another time now um, at this stage. But I think when we look at both birds and bees, the mathematics involved in the design of these little creatures is amazing. And the engineering that uh, the mathematics defines is absolutely amazing. And to me, this is just overwhelming evidence that we have a creator. And to me, this is also powerful evidence that the Bible account, which describes the creator and creation, and which is just so... um, you know, compatible with what we observe, the Bible account, and also historically, the historical aspects of the Bible that we can check all that up. To me, this is just so much evidence that one day we will be accountable to a God, to the Creator who made this beautiful planet and who offers us a relationship with Him who came to earth as Jesus Christ. Uh, performed those miracles of healing, again, that went against the laws of nature, and again uh, proved that he was God by resurrecting himself on that day after that horrible crucifixion and the evidence we have from eyewitnesses. And I think this should all make us realise the the reality of what God offers, a God of love who wants a relationship with us, who wants to change us, to change our mind, to become like him. And, of course, that account is found in the Bible. And as we read the Bible, and particularly the New Testament and particularly the book of John in the New Testament that clearly outlines God's love for us and his wonderful plan for us, it's such an important thing for people to know about. So I hope that as you listen to the program, you'll tell other people about it on your social media. And remember, you've been listening to Faith and Science. And if you want to re-listen to these programs, just Google 3abnaustralia.org.au and click on the listen button. I'm Dr John Ashton. Have a great day. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.